Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As a kid, you would inevitably find me on Sunday evenings at Grandma and Grandpa's house for dinner. And it was, much like the past couple of moments, beautiful chaos. And after the meal, when the adults had had their fill of said beauty, they would play cards, and the kids would go play anywhere else. In the summer, we would run around for hours, and our favorite game was chase. And as the oldest, I was the first to become too sophisticated for such games. After one particularly long enactment that would not end, I performed uh, what I believe to be an Oscar-worthy death scene, thus mercifully ending the endless game. And as I lay there with my eyes closed on the front porch, feeling smug and ready for a nap, I felt a shadow cross my eyes, and I hear my little six-year-old cousin's voice declare, I'm Jesus, you're healed, let's keep playing. <laughs> and that was the first time that I remember someone playing God. Now I notice folks all over the place trying on the mantle. There are a lot of people setting themselves up to be God, or at the very least, God's mouthpiece. And if that's true, God is saying the darndest things these days. Preachers in recent months declare Jesus would build walls. Politicians call lack of access to health care merciful. I was privy to a chaplain telling a dying patient he just wasn't believing hard enough. I've listened to Christian disciples condemn our Muslim, transgender, immigrant, refugee, I could keep going, sisters and brothers. Again and again, I've heard and experienced people using scripture as a sacred weapon to take it upon themselves to separate saint from sinner. And so often it boils down to that line we heard today, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For a long time, it was a line I liked to skip for fear that it would somehow jumpstart a rash of Bible-thumping bruises, but I allowed the danger of these, those self-proclaimed godlings to blind me to the beautiful revelation of God held in this script. As faithful people, we are called to unapologetically speak to the truth that we see, the revelation of faith that we have been experienced, that we have experienced, we know this truth because it speaks deep within us, it resonates, it challenges. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we have experienced that very reality. When Jesus says, no one gets to the Father except through me, for some that brings comfort, and for others like me, it brings squirminess. Until we put it into context. This is Jesus answering Thomas's anxious question, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? When we hear Jesus' loving response to Thomas on his last night of freedom, we can hear Jesus sharing an important truth. It is not prescriptive, but rather descriptive. It is not an ultimatum, but, but another revelation about the nature of our Savior. Jesus is God come among you, living, breathing, experiencing, walking with you, with us. To know Jesus is to know God. Come on, Thomas, I've already showed you what is needed. Now, why is this so important, this distinction and clarification around John 14:6? Because Jesus' loving words of support and direction for Thomas and for us have been used for too long to tear down into silence. What is meant to guide has become a cherry-picked scriptural gate to keep some out and allow others in. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired of turning on the radio and hearing another hateful speech that invokes the name of God. I'm tired of hearing politicians proclaim that it's God's will to revoke health care, to turn away the orphaned and the widow, to legislate the human body. I'm tired of anti-gay rhetoric hiding behind the guise of Christian family values, and I am tired of hearing crickets from my sisters and brothers in faith. And I'm tired of preachers and proselytes taking to the streets and declaring that this is God's will, God's way, the harbinger of God's salvation. 
I'm tired of watching pundits, publicans, and frightened people talk about faith in a God that I have never met. I know the Jesus that heals a woman with a touch, who feeds those who hunger, who celebrates all night at his friend's wedding and flips the tables on unjust systems. I know the Jesus who with a word makes dead men walk, the Jesus who weeps. I know the Jesus who restores widows and children to wholeness and community, who erases lines in the sand faster than we can draw them, who loves sinner and outcast, who died for love, who rose for love, who lives for love. And so where is that Jesus? Because that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus saved me from myself. That Jesus needs to be on the 10 o'clock news and on the front page of every paper. That Jesus needs to be on the front lines of every march for equality, every port welcoming the stranger to new lands, every hospital bed where the lines of life and death blur. And regardless of choices made, hands need to be held. That Jesus needs to stand hand in hand with Muslim sisters and brothers. That Jesus, that love incarnate will set us free. And for too long, perhaps because we fear becoming the supplier of those Bible-bashing bruises, people who know that Jesus have kept silent. We often forget how important it is to witness to the truth, the love, the life that we find in the pierced hands of our God for fear of being just another Christian who harms rather than heals. A couple years ago, I was on the train to Lancaster, Pennsylvania to visit my family. And I made a new friend. My husband will tell you on all train and plane rides, I typically make a new friend. And this guy was fascinating, former pro boxer turned reporter. And we talked about just about anything you can talk about on a three hour train ride. So then toward the end of this ride, he gets up to go to the restroom and there's a young woman sitting across the aisle who rapidly fills his seat. And she tells me, listen, um, I know this is weird. I don't want to be stalkery or anything, but uh, can I email you? And I said, I, sure, I, I, I guess. And so we exchanged information and she got off at the next stop and I figured I'd be invited to be part of a pyramid scheme. But within an hour, within an hour, I received an email from her. And I wish I could say her story was unique, it's not. She grew up in a conservative church and was kicked out at a young age for being too difficult and then later rejected for her sexuality. She's been rejected over and over again by the family that professes to love her and to love God. And her request from me was this. I just need to hear that God still loves me. Can you tell me that? The answer is yes. Unequivocally, Yes, unequivocally, absolutely, without boundaries or reservations, yes. And that is our call as church, as God's people. We need to be the light in the darkness, the voice of love in the chaos, the healing for the hurting. That is our gift of faith. We can shout it from the rooftops and live it every day. I want a world where people think of God and think of love, not wars fought in the name of religion or lives ruined by prejudice dressed up in the trappings of piety. I want people to know the Jesus I know, the one who came into the world not to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these. My friends, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't despair and don't grow weary. God, who invites us to this task, has equipped us for the call. God's love is abundant and the strength that we seek, the faith that we yearn for, the hope that at times flags is supplied by the God who never fails. Amen. <laughs>